Majority Report with Sam Cedar. We are every day casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday. Tuesday, casual Tuesday. Wednesday, casual hump day. Thursday, casual thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, July 22nd, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, it's Casual Friday. Joining us to look back on this week jamel Bowie, opinion columnist at the new york times and co-host of the unclear and present danger podcast also on the program today primetime january 6th committee shows trump's complicity in the capital attack and features josh holly's jogging skills <laughs> meanwhile Department of Homeland Security Inspector General launches a criminal probe into the Secret Service text destruction. Number four, it's not just Joe Biden. COVID cases have shot up across the country. Hospitalizations and deaths up over 20% in the past two weeks. House passes a bill to ensure contraceptive rights only eight Republicans vote in favor. Meanwhile, California to pass a law providing a bounty to successful lawsuits against gun manufacturers and distributors. Turkey says Ukraine and Russia to sign a deal today allowing Ukraine grain to be exported. It's 20 million tons to relieve hunger shortages, uh, I should say food shortages around the world. Amazon workers in North Carolina begin a union drive. Miami bans sex education books in its schools over don't say gay fears. In Oklahoma, librarians are told not to use the word abortion or provide reading resources on how to ob- obtain them. And lastly, it appears <clears throat> that I have gotten the last phone call of my life as the FCC orders U.S. phone companies to block all car warranty robocalls. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is Casual Friday. You can tell by the soft collared shirt I am wearing. And uh, joining me here with, I can't even say, like basically no it's linen. collar. It's linen. Linen. Yes. Wow. Linen. Uh, Emma Viglin. Yeah, I'm um, just in the lightest fabric possible as we're, you know, <laughs> riding out this heat wave here in New York. Indeed. And um, the robocalls thing is. Uh, it's a huge blow. It's a huge blow to me. I will not ever get a phone call again. And, but on the uh, bright side, prep uh, is going to go a little bit smoother because Sam won't be trying to impromptu record him uh, <laughs> harassing somebody who's trying to scam him. Yeah, yeah. that's true. I have a few v- cell phone videos of you being like, hey, get this, get this. Yeah. When yeah. your camera wasn't working. And uh, maybe just I sh- I'll just, up. I'm going to squat on those and release them at a different time. Well, that's great. Let's put the them on the YouTube tapes. channel. Yeah. We'll see if that uh, works out. Uh, I got to say, after last night, got to be very, very careful about outtake videos. Got to be, oh, yeah. uh, got to be sure to destroy those. Um, Jag and Josh. No bloopers. Jag and Josh. Let, <laughs> let's, let's get into this. Um, we've got a lot of clips from the January 6 hearings. They have decided to extend those till September. And, Good. Um, and which I think is, is a smart move. There's a lot of, I mean, there's, and, and, and we'll talk to Jamel about this. Uh, a lot of lessons, I think, from these hearings. But um, let's just start with uh, Fox and Friends. 
because this they always and it's been a while since I feel like we have been, you know, uh, playing any Fox and Friends clips. But you always get a sense of sort of cool. just like what the panic level is, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, on the right from certain things via Fox and Friends. And uh, today, I think, is no different. Um, let's play this as clip number six. Cool. Yeah, so they're going to try to get this right up to November uh, and try to drag this out as long as possible. It is their mo their strongest uh, political play is January 6th. Just I mean, keep in mind, everyone yeah. in that room, they're all against Trump. They're anti-Trumpers. <laughs> Every single person in that room voted to impeach him. Right. Uh, but there, there were some people from insiders that give the account, uh, mm -hmm. the, the give the account of, of what happened. Yeah, right. coming to testify. And it's really uh, interesting because now the, the schism between Pence and Trump is huge. Huge gulf because they played out what Mike Pence was calling out and what the president wasn't doing. And that's why I think Mike Pence is running for president. There's he's an... actually in Arizona and he's trying to actually, I can't believe we're at this point. He's actually. Speaks during the Washington Post today. I was trying to separate himself from President Trump. There's an item in the New I York Post this that. morning that talks a little bit about uh, the Secret Service agents who were with Mike Pence that day. Uh, when they were actually, they, they heard the people coming, they knew they were really close. And according to the story, uh, the Secret Service agents were calling their loved ones to say goodbye because they were so convinced that the rioters uh, were going to kill him. And so they were saying goodbye. Thankfully, uh, you know, they didn't get to the vice president. There's no excuse for a riot. But remember the summer of 2020 when there were all those riots? Wow. Where are the hearings wow. for those riots? For people, you know, burning buildings we, and burning businesses. Uh, you can't. Yeah, let's just pause it for like one second because one, I mean, it should be noted. Is she still with? Is she still with Sean Hannity romantically? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, oh, that is a good question. I had forgotten about that. Because uh, Sean Hannity was all over those hearings last night. Text going to Mark Meadows in and out, in and out. Sean Hannity is a character in these hearings, so her Without dismissiveness of this is personal in many ways. But she's pissed, right? Like even Kill Me doesn't have her back here when she says uh, anti-Trumpers. They're all anti-Trumpers who vote to impeach Trump. That's not even true. That's not the case at all, because the people that were testifying were not right. members of Congress or senators. They were people that worked for him. His, his own aides, like his own staff. Absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, absolutely true. And and it really is fascinating because it you do get the sense. I mean, Ducey is he ha, he is he is not with the program whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And Kilmeade seems to be like, you know, uh, like pacing himself, but you start to get the sense that there is, they're realizing they're going to cut bait here uh, from Trump, except for, of course, uh, Ainsley, who's like, there's no excuse for a riot, but let me see if I can work one up right yeah. now. Yeah. And, and that was also something that, like, it was a good reminder in the testimony last night. There was one uh, staffer who was saying how he was, he resigned because he was disappointed because of Donald Trump's lack of support for the police, uh, because we can't condemn, we have to condemn all violence against police because of all the riots that happened over the summer and the disrespect there. So, like, just a good reminder that. You know, all of these characters in this, uh, the Republicans who are by Trump's side, are still horrible, horrible human beings, um, even though, you know, they're serving this function for us right now. Without a doubt. I mean, Donald Trump doesn't get into this situation and this, uh, uh, you know, it's not like they didn't know this was coming. Right. right. I mean, remember that testimony that we heard uh, from um, the uh, from Meadows uh, uh, right hand woman that uh, Trump's attorney was talking as early as January 2nd, that like, we could all get arrested for this and we could all go to jail. They're talking about this four days before the thing happened. So they knew what was afoot. And uh, they just, they realized at one point, like they don't want to be, they don't want to be uh, rounded up. All right, let's continue to this clip. Is the good one and which one's the bad one? They're all bad. And they all need to be, all these people, Kamala Harris was raising money to get all of these people out of prison that, that were thrown in jail for, um, for rioting. So, and then you had Chuck Schumer on the steps saying to go after the Supreme Court justices, and a guy does, and, uh, and is attempting to assassinate, assassinate uh, um, Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh. So, you know, you can't pick and, and Chuck choose. Schumer's we orders. have to go after all the violent crimes and all the criminals out there. I thought Mark Levin had a good point with uh, Sean last night. He, he said say? the whole goal 
is to make it impossible for Trump uh, yeah. to run again. Sure. And that's the whole goal, sure. uh, to make that argument. All right. Uh, it is exactly 621 here in the East. <laughs> <laughs> they got nothing. Uh, it, it, you know, and, and, and we'll talk about this with Jamel Bowie, but there is there's some polling that shows that, like, it, and it's, it's hard to disaggregate uh, exactly what this is, that this is having a real impact on Republican voters uh, and a key demographic for Republican voters, and that it's not just hurting Donald Trump, uh, that it's actually hurting the Republican Party. Uh, but we will get to that with uh, with Jamel. But the um, yeah, obviously, I mean, I think it goes without saying there is a fundamental difference between just generic violence and violence that is been coordinated by the most powerful people in our government to usurp another branch of government. That's we get a special name for it. It's coup. And they're beautiful people. We love them. <laughs> um, but that is, I mean, that's the fundamental difference here. You know, uh, uh, people can have, you know, take issue with um, uh, uh, property damage that took place during uh, protests about policing, I suppose, if they want. And they can uh, take issue, obviously, people, we should not have uh, randos going after Supreme Court justices or members of Congress, for that matter, as in uh, Pramila Jayapal. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is, when you have one branch of government that is basically getting, um, uh, like, uh, brown shirts or, you know, thugs to go and intimidate another branch of government, that's a real problem. Um, and... Uh, apparently, that is uh, Ashley. I don't know uh, what's Ainsley. going on. Ainsley, uh, yeah. uh, whatever her name is, uh, you know, uh, Hannity's uh, girlfriend. Um, I guess they've been, you know, talking about it and trying to work something out. <laughs> that they can yeah. get some talking points. It's not very good, going very well. Yeah. The what about Black Lives Matter response is like, it, it's amazing. Ainsley's like really representing her audience with, with that there. Yep, and, without and a she doubt. Can't, she can't even really do it convincingly, too, right? Um, but but the, they, pro they, the, the problem is with her audience is that they don't have... There's no way for the uh, Fox audience to think less of people who are marching for uh, on behalf of Black Lives Matter. But there's a lot of room for them to lose respect for Republicans and Trump. And that's the dilemma mm -hmm. they have. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why deploying that just doesn't, isn't effect, as effective as they want it to be. But we'll talk more about that with Jamel. Uh, first, a couple of words from our sponsors. Um, one uh, is a product that I used uh, just this morning when I brush my teeth. I brush my teeth every morning. Uh, Good job, think, Sam. Thank, thank you, Emma. It's appreci I appreciate it. And every evening, and sometimes I'll do it three times a day, but it's generally twice a day. All right. But I do try it, less hard. Here. I do it. Well, wait a second. I do it when I travel. I okay. do it when I uh, and, and I and you know when I was no, younger, I, do it too I was a little bit, yeah. but um, but I also floss every day. Why? Because Quip has designed a toothbrush, a flosser. That is easy to use. I've said this many, many times. Quip gets you, your smile ready. It makes good habits easy. This is the key to brushing your teeth and good dental hygiene. You need to do it every day. And you need to do it well every day. And Quip uh, makes it possible, not just for me, but also for my kids. The Quip electric toothbrush uses time vibrations with 30-second pulses to guide a dentist's recommended two-minute clean it is loved by over 7 million mouths. Many of those mouths are in my family. Uh, you can even upgrade to a new smart motor to track and improve your brushing and earn sweet rewards. You can also get, like I do, the matte black. Um, uh, the, it's an it's a all-black toothbrush. It just looks cool. 
Um, you build your whole routine with even more uh, quip, like the reusable floss pick, which I think is one of the most ingenious devices I've ever seen. Or their refillable mouthwash, so you can say goodbye to those huge plastic containers. And uh, and here's the key with Quip. They deliver your brush heads, they deliver you new fresh floss, and other refills every month for just $5, no extra shipping costs. The whole point is you need to do it. You need to be able to form a habit and keep with it, never have any type of interruption. And that's what Quip does. They're an amazing design company that focus on your dental hygiene. If you go to getquip.com slash majority right now, you'll get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash majority. That's spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash majority. Quip is the good habits company. Also, today's program sponsored by Z-Biotics. Z-Biotics is a probi probiotic drink that breaks down the byproduct of alcohol, which is most responsible for rough mornings after drinking. I didn't know this. We talked about this the other wow. day. I thought it was you get dehydrated after you drink, and that's why you feel sick. That's not it. Basically, in your gut, the alcohol creates some type of toxins that make you feel lousy the next day. So here's what you do. You drink a bottle of Z-Biotics before you go. Uh, you have your first drink of alcohol at night. It's a little tiny uh, thing, uh, like maybe that big, would you say? That big? Yeah, it's it's like a little sh shot. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And uh, one bottle is all you need. Doesn't matter whether you have one drink or multiple ones. You drink mm. responsibly, as you always do. You pace mm. yourself. You get a good night's sleep. And here's the thing. The next day, you feel completely fine. Mm -hmm. Totally refreshed, Interesting. Uh, ready to make the most of it. Here's Matt's how it works. That's salivating at this point. I know. Well, I mean, I need this now. <laughs> um, uh, I went through actually, like I don't know. I gave Emma one, and mm -hmm. I think I, t I think there was like another four or five in the. I was like, box. do you have another? And you said you used them all. No, nope. I used them all. <laughs> well, because after the first time, like you know, I can't. I, 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 if I have a drink the next day, I very often don't feel so great. So I, you know, during the week, I don't do that, but occasionally uh, I get invited across the, the, you know, uh, my, my buddy's house. We go, we have a little bit of uh, a glass of bourbon and I tried the, the Z biotics. It worked. And so then I was able to try it more often. I don't drink that much at all, but it's like, it, it really makes a difference. And like I say, uh, um, the way that Z, Z biotics works is it produces an enzyme it's like the one your liver uses to break down that toxic byproduct. And Z-Biotics is the first genetically engineered probiotic. It's, it's created by alternating the, uh, excuse me, by altering the DNA of a natural probiotic bacteria that we eat all the time. Z-Biotics is not vitamins. It's not plant extracts. It's no shell off the shelf ingredients. Z-Biotics has been rigorously tested and is FDA compliant for safety. If you're the kind of person who enjoys drinks with friends, you want to unwind at the end of the day, still have a full day plan tomorrow, Z-Biotics is perfect for you. doesn't matter whether you want uh, tomorrow to be a productive one, a fun one, a relaxing one, or if you want to go work out, don't let the few drinks the night before ruin it. You can get 15% off your first order of Z-Biotics pre-alcohol pro probiotic. Go to zbiotics.com slash majority. Use the code majority. That's the letter Z. B I O T I C S dot com slash majority coupon code majority at checkout saves you 15 bucks. We'll put the link in our podcast and YouTube description as always. And lastly, uh, today's program also sponsored by sunset lake dot com. Left is best gets you 20% off 20% off. Left is best at sunsetlakesebaday.com. You can check out their tinctures. You can check out their flowers, their um, their uh, keef, their pre-rolls. You can check out their fudge or their uh, gummy bears. They have gummy bears with melatonin. They have sour gummy bears just for chilling out. They have coffee with Sebaday. It is... Um, it, I, it has become a mainstay for me. Uh, all of the, I mean, the pre rolls, the tincture, the melatonin, gummy bears. Is that twenty uh, percent for everything? Twenty percent, all of it. 
Wow. Is off. A left is best. And you can check out, they have third parties that uh, test all of their, their products, give you exactly the ingredients that are in there, the percentages of the various chemicals that you find in CBD, all natural chemicals, of course. They do not use um, uh, pesticides. They use integrated pest management uh, and organic fertilizer. They use integrated, uh, I should say, uh, regenerative farming practices and they're great movement partners. They've donated uh, over $25,000 over the past couple of years to things like um, soup kitchens and uh, union uh, uh, strike funds and Innocence Project and against, um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, organizations that fight against the drug war. Just a great, great uh, company. Sunset Lake, sebaday.com, 20% off. All right. Uh, do we need to take a quick break? Yeah, let's just take a quick break, and then we'll bring Jamel in. Okay. I'm uh, going to take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, Jamel Bowie, opinion columnist at the New York Times, co-host of the Unclear and Present Danger podcast. <laughs> We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Want to welcome back to the program Jamel Bowie. He's an opinion columnist at the New York Times, a co-host the Unclear and Present Danger podcast. Jamel, uh, welcome back to the program. Thank you for having me back. Um, I want to get to the the January 6th uh, hearings and 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 what's going on with the with the Biden plus the generic thing. But let's let's just I, I mean talk about um, what's happening. In, in the Senate for a moment. You wrote about Joe Manchin, obviously, you know, um, a, a killing his latest proposal. <laughs> um, Eating and, his own, which he doesn't really care about. He, I mean, um, and and the, just the, the, the sheer dysfunction that is the Senate. Um, and, and we're seeing this also, I mean, it, there's just a lot of extraordinary things happening right now over the past month and a half that I think um, are, I don't know, I feel like I've been saying this uh, quite a bit over the past really six years, um, you know, relative to, to back in the day where things seem to be more sort of two or three dimensional as opposed to like seven dimensional. Yeah. But um, uh, just give me your sense of like what's happening with the Senate. It, it, it's just, it's just, we're, we're going through a heat wave now in this country. Europe is on fire. Um, and we're, there's just total inaction on this like massively urgent sort of uh, a crisis we're facing. Right. Well, you know, obviously Manchin is um, trying to triangulate against the National Democratic Party in this weird way of proposing, making proposals. And then as soon as other Democrats agree to the proposal, it's like, well, now it's too liberal, so I have to back off of it. But I think that's more just a symptom of the fundamental problems with the Senate itself. Um, the Senate is was designed, right, to be quite elitist, designed to shut down on popular legislation. That's more or less the function it has served. 
um, giving every state right an equal say on legislation, allowing the Senate to originate legislation really gives it this powerful veto over popular legislation under the House, which is unlike any other upper house in any other democracy, like no other country works like this. Uh, and I don't think it's a surprise that no other country's uh, legislature seems to be so uh, ill-equipped to function. Because it's it's beyond kind of the structural things of the Senate. It's just if you observe if you've observed them over the last four or five years, what's striking is just like how much they don't seem to want to work, right? Sort of like how much they there's like this you know we got to go on recess, we got to go campaign, um, but there's like this real desire to not want to do anything. Uh, and to kind of just like rest on laurels and enjoy the perks. And I think it's all, I mean, I, I think you're seeing that with Manchin. I think, I think Manchin enjoys very much being the center of attention and that's sort of like what he's doing. Um, maybe it's ideological, maybe it has something to do with this pocketbook, but I think kind of the big thing is he's a bit of a diva and this makes, this gives him a lot of attention to be at the center of negotiations. And that kind of attitude, I think the Senate actually like, the Senate encourages um, and it's just not good for lawmaking or legislating or anything like governing. And accordingly, you know, even, you know, the House under um, Pelosi the past couple of years, there's lots to criticize, but it's been much more productive in terms yes. of actually doing something um, compared to the Senate. Well, I, that raises actually there's three the three points. One, I, we, sh we should always mention that, you know, Manchin has gained, I don't know, close to 20 points in, in favorability uh, since in, embarking on this project of being the, the you know, the Democrat uh, thwarter. The second thing that occurs to me as you say that is, you know, Dick Durbin had a quote uh, the other day. They were asking whether the Senate would deal with the sort of, uh, I guess you, you call them uh, at this point wedge votes uh, in, in terms of protecting uh, abortion rights and protecting contraception and protecting uh, marriage equality. Um, we should say the the contraceptive bill only passed with eight Republican votes, which is stunning to me. There was 47 that they had uh, in terms of uh, the marriage equality. And Durbin was asked, are you guys going to vote for this? And he's like, well, we, we really should, but, uh, you know, we don't have that much time left in the, uh, the, the, we don't have much time left in, in the, um, uh, uh the calendar because we got to go on vacation. And I just like thinking like, are you kidding me? Right. Like, on one hand, you're sending out all these emails saying the, the, the planet's on fire. And on the other hand, you're saying like, well, some folks really want to, you know, I don't know, go and go to their, you know, their lake house or whatever it is. Like it's insane. Right. No, I, I agree. It's, <laughs> you have to ask like, what are you even there for? Like if, if, if uh, going on vacation is more important than um, at the very least putting your opponents in a tough spot, your opponents who have embarked on an extremely unpopular crusade here and sort of outlawing abortion and going after contraception and really putting them on the spot um, ahead of the midterms, you would think that that's a thing that they would want to do. But there's like this disconnect between um, what is what, what appears to be at least politically intelligent uh, and sort of the 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 attitudes, the habits that the Senate develops in its members, which is this like chumminess and going along to get along, and I think laziness. I mean, I really think that a defining attribute of the Senate is just a profound laziness among the members. But isn't part of it, too, there's a fundamental, I think, belief, not on with every member of the Senate, but with, say, a Mark Warner or a Joe Manchin, uh, that they are a... Uh, a, a stoppage on the the rabble rousers and the direct democracy action that if the house was running the show which i would prefer um that 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 that, that would create right like that's why they're so committed to the filibuster because that is another mechanism by which they can uh hold the reins back on democracy essentially and for the most part what that largely does is protects m moneyed interests and so that's why someone like Manchin um is is successful in his role in the Senate frankly 
I think that's right. And it's entirely asymmetrical too, right? It's not as if when Republicans hold both chambers of Congress, they um, they sort of resist the kinds of legislation coming out of the House. Like if there's agreement on a policy platform among Republicans, they pursue it. Uh, it's only among Democrats and, and really due to, you know, the wide, you know, the, the broadness of the Democratic coalition uh, that the Senate or Democratic senators feel this need to act as like this backstop on things coming out of the House, even though it's never been politically successful for them, right? Like you, you can't actually count the time when killing something that came out of the House or delaying some important piece of legislation or um, undermining the Democratic president's agenda, you can't think of a situation in the past 30 years when this has ever been successful for Senate Democrats or congressional Democrats. And yet, um, yet they persist at it. And uh, I, think, I think it's sort of mindless at this point. I don't think they know how to do anything else. What... what uh, I, I... What, why why is there no is there a price that is paid i mean and the, the, like i i guess i have a like a it's like a three part question for you um is there a price that is paid does the house you mentioned the house have been very productive but but sometimes they're productive at the expense of using their leverage with the senate right and i'm thinking about they passed the Build Back Better bill. Well, that's all well and good, but everybody knew that if they split it up, the chances of the Senate doing it would be nil or, or pretty close to nil. I know they got promised by the White House, et cetera, et cetera. But should the House, and I don't think it's going to happen under Nancy uh, Pelosi's leadership, but I'm thinking in the future, uh, should the House, should part of the House's job be to not just pass legislation on their own, but to do it? in a way that leverages um, the, you know, the politics in terms of the Senate. And also aside from that, like what, how do we penetrate this? Like as, as like voters and people uh, like uh, and citizens, like how do we penetrate this, um, this sort of like, I don't know, this, this rampart that is the Senate. So as far as whether there's a price to pay, I think there is a political price to pay. I think you can at least trace some of Biden's declining approval ratings to the fact that it seems as if there's just complete stasis in Washington. And I think that owes itself to the Senate. I think, you know, Manchin might have improved his impro approval ratings for the West Virginians, but his colleagues are not really doing well under this status quo where the Senate just doesn't look like it's doing anything. Um, I think that in terms of uh, what the House should do. I think you're right to suggest that the House should just like be more aggressive um, with regards to the Senate. You know, that the, what political scientists say that the United States party government, right, sort of like the House and the Senate don't really operate as, uh, you know, separate institutions that are like jealous of their authority. It's like whatever party controls them tries to coordinate with their um, fellow party members in the other House. But I think it's worth, it'd probably be worth for the House not under not under Pelosi, but under some future leader, to begin being much more aggressive with the House's powers and much more aggressive about like pressuring the Senate um, and pressuring the White House into actually you know doing something. And as far as what the public can do, I mean, what's interesting I think is that um, public complaints, uh, you know, uh, public disapproval of the Senate's um, you know slow movingness. All these things, I think it's actually begun to have an effect, not so much on currently serving senators, or at least the, the marginal ones that we need to actually move. But like you look at John Fetterman in Pennsylvania, you look at Tim Ryan in Ohio, you look at um, you look at any any Democrat running for Senate anywhere. No one supports the filibuster, right? Like no one supports none of the none of the Senate as, uh, aspirants support the kinds of um, obstructionist procedures that a mansion or a cinema does. And so I think that, you know, I think we're I think we're witnessing the last uh, group of Senate Democrats who have some commitment to these procedures. I think future crops of Senate Democrats will just uh, dismiss this stuff as uh, not needed, as useless. Yeah, as I would say even as as obviously as detrimental. I mean, this is right. the way that you sort of like obscure uh, what is happening in the Senate. I think um, uh, from people. Um, let's talk about. Uh, uh, the 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 January six hearings uh, to a certain extent. I mean, but in the context of of something that's sort of fascinating that's going on, the Joe Biden's polling is n nearly as bad as I think I've 
uh, ever been around a, a, an American president's polling. I mean, you know, George Bush hit some pretty low lows, and I think Carter did too, although I don't know if it was even this low. Um, but he's in, he, I mean, he, he is like not liked by a, a, a lot of people, or at least uh, unfavorable as, as president. But you, it, that's not, it doesn't, it's almost like divorced from what's happening with the Democrats and the Republicans. And on top of that, the, the polling is just, there is, um, I mean, part of it is abortion, but part of it, I think, is also um, the January 6th hearings. There was a, there's a poll that just came out, CNN uh, and SSRS, um, 47% of those age 65 and over said they'd vote for the Republican candidate if the midterm congressional election in their district was held today. And this is uh, um, over age 65, 49% cent, uh, said they would vote Democratic. And that um, that was 15 point um, reversed in May. In May, it was of uh, two thirds, 62% of 65 and over said they'd vote for a Republican and 37% said they would vote for a Democrat. May to July, it, it must be the January 6th hearings, right? I mean, I, I don't know, or, 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 or and abortion, I guess. I think it's probably a combination of the two, right? Sort of, again, Republicans have embarked on this extremely unpopular project. Like every day there are new stories of horrible things happening to women and girls who are pregnant, who need abortions, who need, you know, uh, miscarriage care or ectopic uh, pregnancy care. So that's obviously reaching the public and people are responding very negatively to it, as you would expect them to. But I think you're right that the January 6th committee has also, it's made an impact. And that's sort of, I mean, one of, one of the um, arguments during the Trump years, I think, among Democrats was between those who thought that the path back to power for the Democratic Party was to focus on, you know, kitchen table issues and things that matter to American families um, or, uh, you know, create a spectacle around Trump's corruption um, and uh, criminality and that voters would respond negatively to Trump if you create that spectacle. And I think what we're seeing with the January 6th committee is like evidence that the latter view was correct, that creating a spectacle over the January 6th insurrection, which is what these committee hearings are. I mean, I'm sure you guys watched the ones last night where, Josh, where they showed that video of Josh Hawley running away, yes. which is very funny. Um, was, let's play that right now. Yeah. <laughs> let's just play it because it is, we haven't played it yet. And it is really funny. In fact, there was a clip. I don't know if we have that clip too. There was a clip of of like people laughing. Um, I don't know if that was like it was like yes. A, d, 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 the d, d, gallery, d, d, like people who were watching, just burst out burst in out laughter. laughter. But here is the at the, Jug and Josh. That's here, what it's gonna be on the campaign trail. Here is a, a clip of of Josh Hawley. Remember Josh Hawley. Given the 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 solidarity power uh, sign to these uh, folks when they were outside. And then giving the, I'm I'm exiting stage uh, prancing away, <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. And that power sign was when he was behind a barricade of cops. Uh, so what a tough guy this guy is. You're my people. Don't hurt me. <laughs> Senator Josh Hawley also had to flee. Earlier that afternoon, before the joint session started, he walked across the east front of the Capitol. As you can see in this photo, he raised his fist in solidarity with the protesters already amassing at the security gates. We spoke with a Capitol Police officer who was out there at the time. She told us that Senator, Senator Hawley's gesture riled up the crowd, and it bothered her greatly because he was doing it in a safe space, protected by the officers and the barriers. Later that day, Senator Hawley fled after those protesters he helped to rile up stormed the Capitol. See for yourself. <laughs> do, do. Do, do, do. <laughs> there we go. Running away. Run Running away. Down some stairs. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I just put the uh, the the uh, the, the reaction the, the reaction 
in the gallery. This is um, pure, pure gold. Um, check this out. Do we have it? Yeah. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> People texting each other. Oh my god! I mean, it again. Uh, just play more. it again. Yeah, play it again. Go ahead. <laughs> you want to run for president? You like that, to run. We all go. know yes, you like running. to run. He's Jag running. and Josh. So I mean, this this is the kind of thing that catches people's attention, yes. and it, it filters down to the public. And I think it, you know, it help, it's helping build an image of the entire Republican Party, or at least everyone aligned with Trump. That's really negative for the party, uh, and I think that is probably affecting its approval ratings because the, the the divergence between Biden's approval and sort of the Democratic performance from the generic ballot is is unprecedented. We haven't really seen this before, um, and I think it I think it's what it signals is that while Biden might be very unpopular. So is the Republican Party. Uh, and given the choice, at least at this point, voters would rather have Democrats in office uh, than they would Republicans because of the unpopularity of the Republican Party. You know, it's interesting because, um, I mean, look, this is happening from May to July. And, 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 and folks who are over age 65 um, would be much more likely to have been aware of a pre-row world, right, and they would have been much more uh, impacted uh, by they. You know, they're 15 years old at a minimum when row is overturned. I mean, or I should say, is established, um, and so they they could be far more sensitive to this. Um, but what what strikes me about interesting about the you know to the extent that it's it's from January 6th is that. One of the other, I mean, you mentioned there were two sort of strategies, right, by the Democrats. Do you make a spectacle out of Trump? Do you, uh, or do you do the, the, you know, let's let's do this huge bill where we're going to vote in the House on, you know, forty-five different proposals that, you know, people really, you know, each chair of each committee can tout to their own people. But there's also like a sort of a a a, a subcategory of the Trump one is, do you, like bind the Republican Party to Donald Trump. Right. And that I think there was a huge failure to do that by the Democrats starting in the summer of 2016. I mean, Chuck Schumer was bragging about having I think the exact quote was something like I've got uh, Schumer because he refers to himself in the third party for whatever third person, Schumer, Ryan and uh, Clinton. And we're going to do the tax repatriation deal. I mean, going way back here. But they they wanted to protect, I think, you know, uh, uh, Ryan and McConnell and, and allow, you know, Trump to sort of pass through. And there was never that conjoining people. But the interesting thing that happened with January 6th is. No Republicans end up on the committee, except for Kinzinger and, and who have been and, and, and Cheney, who have been ostracized there in the leper colony of the Republican Party. And so there like it's had this effect in a in a multiple ways, both in the operation of the committee and on the politics. What What's your sense of that in terms of like it's one thing to say, like, I no longer like Donald Trump, but it's another to say, like, I don't like the Republicans as a function of this these hearings. Right. I mean, I think even if this wasn't necessarily the intent you know, connecting the insurrection to a wide range of figures within the Republican Party. You know, the fact that Republicans aren't on the committee and we're even opposed to it. I think all those things do in themselves create this connection. Um, Democrats are very afraid of appearing too partisan, but I think that this sort of partisan spectacle is actually very effective. And it's very effective because it breaks through the, you know, it breaks through all the noise of everyday life in American politics. It makes people pay attention. Most people have, uh, if they have no interest in politics, they have too many things going on to bother paying off that much attention. And so to grab them, you need to do something that is dramatic. And this is dramatic. Um, and P I, think, I think voters are kind of naturally making the connection between January 6th committee and Republican Party. I think Democrats could do more to say, you know, if you don't want these people, right, like Jim Jordan and Kevin McCarthy, 
if they win, if Republicans win the majority, will be top leaders in the House of Representatives. If you don't want these Trump pro-insurrection acolytes to be you know, hold that kind of power, you have to vote for Democrats. And just to kind of say that again and again and again and do things that capture people's attention, even if even if they're very partisan, even if they're going to engender a little backlash from like the mainstream press, like who cares? Right. Well, like I think I think just just. Yeah. Real quick. I, I'm I'm always loath to give Trump credit for anything. But one thing I will give Trump credit for is a recognition of this dynamic in American politics, that what matters most is making the splash. And then after that, once you have the attention, that is the important thing. Yeah, 100 percent. And and I, I um, it's un, their message is undercut by Nancy Pelosi going out every second and saying, well, we, we need a strong Republican Party. Right. And, and Biden saying this is not the real Republicans. But even with that messaging being so convoluted, the committee's findings are so powerful and frankly well put together that it overrides it and the fact that msnbc and cnn are wall-to-wall -wall covering this and it was on abc news last night and it, i think it was on cbs wherever you look it's just a taste of what republicans have been doing for decades with fox news which is just blitzing the media with their narrative um, and you see the effects of that in the polling, as Sam pointed out, it moves things when you are unabashed in your message on a particular uh, issue set and and, um, you know, you're actually doing politics. Right. Uh, I, you know, my, my preference would be for Democrats to have, you know, during the Trump years to have had like a standing committee on Trump yeah. corruption yeah. that is just like constantly holding public hearings. Um, but since that's we're already past that to at least not wrap this thing up, to just like keep it going as long as possible, sort of like, you know, keep investigating. Because here's the other thing. I think I think Democrats have this like weirdly mecha uh, mechanistic vision of what politics are, at least like some congressional Democrats, which is that like, you know, there is the economy and, you know, when it's up, people like us, when it's down, people don't like us. Um, you know, if we if, if we investigate something and there isn't like an immediate effect and it's not really worth doing because like if it was and we go up and so on and so forth. But what we've seen with this committee is that just the mere act of doing the investigation, and doing it publicly has surfaced more stuff. Right. Like people start coming forward with more stuff, which becomes more grist for the mill. It, it, beca it becomes it, it, it develops its own kind of it, it takes on a life of its own um, that can be quite powerful. I mean, this is basically what happened with Bill Clinton. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like the beginning, like, you know, investigations what? end up uh, yielding more investigations. And while it is true that Clinton wasn't like, you know, Clinton wasn't like fatally harmed by all of this and ended up Democrats end up taking some seats in the 98 midterms. I think it did serve at least Republicans to generate energy for their party and help them win a big midterm victory in 94. And I think it helped them win in 2000 by like tainting Al Gore with the stench of scandal. Well, that's why Al Gore got, that's why Al Gore chose Joe Lieberman, which right. alienated part of his base. I mean, there was, without a doubt, I mean, it, 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 it had a ripple effect that you can't, that is intangible. But I would also add Benghazi to that because, yes. because, you know, they had Benghazi, 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 but people forget the whole server thing for Clinton came out, Hillary Clinton came out of the Benghazi hearings. And this is the first example that I've seen where Democrats, and part of it is sad to say, it's because I, I would imagine it's because they're in part being driven by two Republicans who 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 <laughs> by, understand by a... this dynamic. You know, like right. I, I I I I I will take a a second place to no one in terms of my disdain for uh, Lynn Cheney. Um, Liz. And, Liz. Liz Cheney. I, I always have to think, but for both of them, frankly, um, but Liz and Lynn, but, but they know how to do this. Right. You know, in 2019, she's out there, you know, leading uh, a, a press conference talking about how Democrats want are, are cheering on people killing babies after they're born. I mean, she's literally saying this and she knows exactly how to do this without any sort of like self-consciousness or she just is going for it. Now, it, you know, she, and, and the other thing that strikes me is that, you know, I was thinking about 
the, it, and you hear Kinzinger and Cheney will use the clown car. They set up that dichotomy between the sort of like the normal Republicans and the Trump Republicans, when in fact it's really just the regular, you know, it's just like it's they're all Republicans. That's just the way the Republican Party works. There's slightly, you know, uh, some are slightly more unhinged than others. But the 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 open lane that the committee has without having Republicans on there who are against the existence of the committee, like this idea. And, and, and I wonder, maybe it's just hopeful thinking that maybe the Democrats will get this idea that, like, we don't have to be bipartisan. You know, like, I don't, they, I doubt they'll get the idea from it because they're like, well, we had the cover of allowing for them to be, but does anybody remember who's watching this? Anybody, like, is there any of these seniors, if they've turned because of, uh, of the committee thinking like, this is only legitimate because Pelosi had offered an independent commission first and they rejected it and then said, put people on. But uh, the Republicans were so <laughs> irresponsible in putting people on who were going to have to testify, maybe like, no, nobody remembers that. Right. But I, I don't know if the Democrats will get that lesson from this right or at least they don't have to be substantively bipartisan you can you whatever you can say whatever but when it comes to actually doing the thing no one no one cares no one pays attention and um i i would hope that the democrats learn this learn that lesson from all of this i think this this uh this committee the january 6th everything um it should be an important lesson for congressional Democrats and how to do politics in a way that resonates with the broad public. I think that if Democrats end up doing better than they expect in the midterms, you, I think we'll be able to make a good case that this committee stretching out through most, you know, half the year ends up playing an important part in shaping the overall media environment for how people think about the Republican Party. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think I think Biden, if he wanted to improve his approval, should start picking fights with Republicans. Uh, when that story about that um, that little girl who had to go to go to Indiana to get an abortion came down, and uh, you know, but Biden talked about it. He was like, this, he expressed his sort of horror at it in a press conference, and then sort of, you know, the Republicans and much of the right had a total meltdown. They were trying to disprove the story, say that it was fake, and then it was obvi obviously it came out. You know, this is a true story. This really happened. We have all the documentation. I thought that was a political win for the Biden for the White House. I think that that kind of thing works um, because it it puts your opponents on the defensive. When uh, when Biden was it last year when he was like uh, uh, pushing for the voting rights bill and he uh, asked if Republicans wanted to be like with Bull Connor and they all got very huffy and Mitch McConnell would be like, "Well, I'm not Bull Connor." I think if you can get the leader of the Senate Republican to like say, "I'm not Bull Connor," I think you're 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 <laughs> you're exactly. like doing something right. And so that's the kind of approach you have to take, which requires people to like let go of this bipartisanship, let go of this notion that um, you know, the the thing here is like maintaining our, our our friendly relationships with the opposition because they don't particularly care. Like that, you know, Mitch McConnell doesn't care about being friendly. He'll, he'll, he 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 Mitch McConnell's reputation for ruthlessness and genius, I think it's really just he has figured out how this game works and he's willing to play it um with no apologies. And there's no reason his opponents can't do the same. All right, let's. I just want to talk about uh, uh, one other thing too that you wrote about uh, because this is um, one of the things that have been really scary has been watching Republicans assume election official positions in key states around the country who um, buy into Donald Trump's you know stolen election narrative and. The, the idea that this is, you know, they're setting it up for for Trump, for DeSantis, for whomever it is. Yeah, I, I think I said in, in this column that it was a good bill, and I think it is a good bill. Um, what it does is on the state side, it first, you know, clarifies that the only votes, um, electoral votes Congress is going to count are the ones uh, uh, are the ones allocated according to the method present before the election. Right. And so, like. If a state, like all states, allocate their electoral college votes by popular vote, and that's what happens on the election, then those are the electoral votes. Those are the electors that are going to count. Um, and this idea that's been floated among some Republicans that you can kind of like retroactively, you can, you know, you can say it's a fraudulent election and then like select new electors in the Washington. The bill is trying to preclude that. 
Um, it says that, you know, unless otherwise specifically designated in state law, it's the governor of the state who is responsible for certifying electors, and they must do so by a particular date um, to avoid attempts to kind of like subvert the process after that. And if there's some sort of, you know, let's say you have some kind of MAGA um, secretary of state and governor and whomever who, you know, refuses to honor the results of the election, refuses to certify the electors, then the candidate can actually um, appeal, you know, sue basically in federal court. And it becomes an expedited process by which a, a panel of federal judges will decide on the where to go from this. Um, and although this doesn't, you know, this doesn't fill me with a ton of confidence, there's then like an expedited process to go to the Supreme Court. Um, so that's, I mean, that's... Uh, I'll get to sort of a point I make in the column later, but that's sort of what it does on the state side. And on the congressional side, it raises the barrier to objections to electors from one member of each chamber to one fifth of each chamber. Um, so you have to have actually like a lot of people objecting to make the objection count. It clarifies that the vice president, you know, is just there as a ceremonial thing, like has no real role other than just like to be there and announce things. Um, and there's one more thing it does. Oh, and if there is like if there is some uh, you know catastrophe that affects the election, it kind of sets procedures for when you can hold a new election. But it doesn't let states kind of just like unilaterally declare that oh fraud election we gotta we we gotta get rid of the electors. So it, it basically tries to plug the holes um, that Trump tried to exploit uh, in the months between the election and January six. The one issue with all of this, and, and it's sort of two things. The first is that kind of as long as we have the Electoral College, it's going to be very tempting to pull these shenanigans because elections don't necessarily turn on millions of votes. They turn on a few thousands of votes. Right. And so there's going to be a real temptation, I think, going forth, as there's, as there's always been, to try to manipulate things at the county level, manipulate things at the precinct level to get rid of votes that could mean the difference between right sort of the presidency, right? Like a couple thousand votes in Wisconsin could mean the difference between the presidency and not the presidency. And that is purely a function of the Electoral College. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that as you know, as long as this big part of the Republican Party is more or less like opposed to honoring elections it doesn't win, you're just gonna have problems, right? Like at the end of the day, you need both sides to be like, these are the procedures, this is the process. If we lose, we can try again next time and you like honor the results and you let the, the the winner take power. But if you have one party that's just like, we're not going to do that. No thanks. Then there's really no set of rules or procedures you can like figure out that's going to like protect the system in the long term. Um, what are the chances this is going to pass? And then uh, what are the chances the Supreme Court strikes it down? <laughs> well, I think the chances it'll pass are actually pretty good. Um, it seems to avoid anything that might like get in the way of, um, you know, many Republicans, right? First of all, it has more Republican co-sponsors co -sponsors than Democratic co-sponsors, which is a good sign. And the other thing is that because it doesn't really deal with the administration of elections, it just kind of sets parameters for, for deadlines and who can do what and, and whatnot, I think that gets, it kind of avoids the um, tricky spots for a lot of Republicans. Which is I, expanding the franchise. Right, exactly. Letting more <laughs> right. people vote. That's the thing right. they're very, right. very upset right. about. Right, of course. Um, uh, I, the Supreme Court, so... The Supreme Court, like, you got to think who would sue to sort of, like, take this case to the court. And I can't think of anyone because the Constitution does give the Congress, like, explicit power to regulate federal elections. It's like a thing that the, the same clause that conservatives are using to advance this ludicrous argument that state legislatures can do whatever they want says, like, in the very next sentence that Congress can make regulations as it so see fits. And so... This is an expressly delegated power to the Congress. There's no reason for the court to um, to really do anything. Uh, you know, the one caveat I would make is that you know the Constitution and the Fifteenth Amendment also gives Congress the explicit power to um, stop discrimination in voting on the basis of race as it sees as it sees fits. It can do whatever it wants to make sure that doesn't happen. And the Supreme Court has somehow like written this out of the Constitution, right? That's essentially said this doesn't exist. So 
stipulating that just because the Constitution says a thing doesn't mean the court is going to acknowledge that it says that thing. Um, that's that's always a danger. But at least on, on on its face, this is a perfectly constitutional piece of legislation that the court has no real basis for um, for overturning. It's good that you added that qualifier because I was gonna I was gonna see if we we could get a bet going. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, and, and I mean that is uh, that at least the idea that that would be out there is at least you know some uh, some I guess uh, assurance. But it's gonna be fascinating to see um, in, in the coming months if if Donald Trump jumps into the you know the presidential race because he's worried. It sounds like he's worried about what's happening in Georgia in terms of that investigation there. I mean, it doesn't appear that Merrick Garland is, you know, hot on the trail, as it were. But Georgia certainly seems to be um, vigorous. If he jumps in with these numbers already trending this way and the announcement that there's going to be more hearings in September, which I also I have to say, I criticize Democrats a lot, but I think this is just. It's just brilliant that yeah. they're continuing this. I mean, it is. They, they should schedule hearings for the day before the election. Yes. <laughs> without a doubt. Without a doubt. And like, like when, when you're going to vote, the last thing you should see on the news is news about the January 6th committee. With, without a doubt. I mean, it just seems to be um, uh, effective. And the idea that they have this sort of open um, uh, field because there's no, you know, Republican asking questions you know you can imagine what what the questions would have been jim jordan is there and you know uh, uh mark meadows uh, uh right hand woman uh, goes to give a, a testimony and he's just like what is a woman you know like <laughs> that would be uh the the thing I, hopefully they learn a lesson from it uh jamel Bowie, thank you so much of your time today um we will put a link to your uh, last couple of pieces in the times i found them really uh fascinating uh, particularly on that electoral thing. I, I just it wasn't up on that. Really appreciate you coming on today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much. All right, folks. Going to head into uh, the fun half of the program. We got clips from the January 6th uh, commission. We've got a replay of Emma sneezing that we we're going to keep. I know. I, I think uh, it's at least once a show. At least once a show I sneeze. But we'll see if we can get to two today. We've got to, uh, some IMs. We may take some uh, phone calls as well. Um, just a reminder, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only help the show survive and thrive, you get the free show free of commercials, and you get the fun half, um, which is on occasion fun. Not always, but on occasion fun. Yes. It's certainly always uh, worth it. Let's put it that way. Um, and don't forget, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. You get 10% off. We will have links to uh, for members who want the, um, the discounts that are offered by our sponsors today, including Sunset Lake Sabade, uh, in the podcast and YouTube descriptions. Uh, Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Well, soon, hopefully, we'll be having uh, Left Reckoning merchandise, but I don't know if I'm ready to announce the store name yet. But uh, we'll be doing a Think Tank this weekend, and there will be a Lex stream this evening uh, 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 featuring David Alexis, who uh, formerly, uh, people might know, he was organizing a driver's co-op uh, uh, contra the Uber and Lyft platforms, and now he's uh, running for office in District 21 in New York. Sweet. Also a fan of the show. Awesome. Even better. Did, what, what's happening with that Uber thing? I mean, the. Uh, uh, the well, well, I'll ask him about it. But uh, he, as for him, he's running for office now, trying okay. to get people uh, state uh, health care. Beautiful. All right. We're going to take a quick break. Um, we may take calls. May not. 646 257 3920. I'll announce that call number uh, when we get to the other side. Maybe, yeah, we will, I think, take calls today. Okay. Um, all right. See you in the fun half. So I can't find my mouse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Left is best. Jamie and I may have a dis.
disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. 